Pods and Ends, the junk drawer of pop culture and geek podcasts. Well, hello and welcome back to episode four of Pods and Ends. In today's show, we have Off the Shelf, What's Your Jam? The Locker Room, Netflix and Chill, and the main event of The Silver Screen. But before we go any further, let's introduce who we've got here today. I'm Phil. It's Sophie. I'm Brian. And I'm Shelby. <laughs> <laughs> so, once again, episode four, we have a whole full contingent of pods and ends. Woohoo! Hosts. That's the what we are, hosts. Are here. Yes, it is. So, let's get straight in there. Off the shelf. Turn off the television. In fact, why don't you turn off all the lights except for the one over your favourite chair? It's time for off the shelf. Safe to you? Yeah, I have just tonight finished my book that I've been reading. It's taken me almost a month to finish this particular one. I'm reading the... I'm deep into the New Jedi Order at the moment, which... If anyone's listening who's kind of completely new to us, might not know. I don't know. Maybe most of you do. But Star Wars have books. They've all had books for years and years and years. Spinning off of the the films. Actually, you probably would have heard that from our Expanded Universes episode the other week. And so the New Jedi Order was what is now being classified as Legends. So this is all pre the Disney takeover. And it is a 19 series of books, like a 19 book series um, spanning kind of, it, it's it's an entire war. And I'm very, very close to the end at the moment. But I thought Off the Shelf was a good opportunity for me to just bring up this series. I won't go into Star Wars books in general because it's just like, where do we even begin? But the New Jedi Order in particular was quite a, quite a divisive, uh, would that be fair to say? People either, it was a Marmite series. I think only <laughs> Brian's read it, yeah? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you read the whole thing, right? I've skipped a couple books. I don't remember which ones. And I think I did it in, uh-huh. like, not the right order. But I just oh. read them, like, how I found them. I used to get all my Star Wars books secondhand. So uh-huh. I would just pick up whatever I happen to have. So I got through it. I basically know what happens. Yeah. Vong for life, yeah. that's the important thing. Long for life, indeed. Um, but people, people kind of like this was like this was probably the last Jedi of its time, right? <laughs> Apart from maybe like the prequels. Yeah, stuff. I was gonna say aside from the prequels, <laughs> the prequels are the first really like love it or hate it Star Wars thing, and then yeah, the Vong were. But I mean, I guess that's just because they're the the extra stuff has always been like a layer below, where mm-hmm. the movies you have those quote unquote regular fans that make their opinions about it. And the same with The Last Jedi. You know, any regular person can tell you what they think of that. But, you know, Mm. it's the inside baseball people that either love or hate the Vong. And hate means that you're wrong. So, just saying. (laughs) That's that awesome. It's basically the thing I really, I've enjoyed about it. Not only getting to spend, you know, 19 books. It is a massive commitment. And I know that that it's off-putting. It was off-putting for someone you know, even I was put off by it and I'm a relatively quick reader. So it's a big endeavor. Um, but something I, I actually really enjoy the fact that I feel we can get really, really stuck into these characters and the events. You know, I, I know these characters better than any characters I know. I've never read anything with more than 19 books before, you know, sort of Jason and Jane are pretty much as fully formed to me as, you know, Han, Luke and Leia. Um, But the particularly fun thing about the New Jedi Order is it goes into this uncharted territory of it's not the Empire or some sort of Imperial remnant or, you know, Mm -hmm. it's an alien invasion in Star Wars. And to me, that's awesome. (laughs) That was actually my favorite part of it, too. It was so different. They didn't find, Mm. like, clone 375 of the Emperor and suddenly (laughs) the dark side is back. Oh, no. But it was something... (laughs) 
completely different and they actually have this like weird voidness of force so it's not like Mm -hmm. the alternate it's the absence of so yeah it was interesting yeah please go that direction again star wars yeah it was an interesting handicap i thought for the i'm i'm actually really down for anything that stifles the jedi's power slightly um which is weird because i do love the force and i love it when you know sith and jedi clash and all the rest of it but at the same time I am into that whole, yeah, hamstring in the Jedi slightly. So the the Salamiri, I was always pretty into as well. That was quite a fun oh, thing yeah. of like, well, let's see Luke figure out how to get out of this situation without the Force. Um, even if the premise is a little bit dumb, I like seeing him having to work his way out of a situation rather than just boom, Force, God powers, um, which was similar with the Vong. Like they have to actually really think and sometimes they don't pull it off and they die repeatedly Mm -hmm. which is really awkward especially when you're reading these books in public like i do i tend to do most of my reading in coffee shops and i've embarrassed myself watching the uh reading these books in coffee shops and then doing some public crying which is super embarrassing this coffee just makes me really emotional. <laughs> <laughs> I was just like, how can... Luckily, I've got long hair, so it kind of like fell across and I just was... Yeah. But anyway, if you haven't checked out the new Jedi Order, I highly recommend it. It is a big commitment, but it's worth it. Yeah, like they're good it. stories. Okay, so we normally have our true beauty update right now, but unfortunately, one member of the team hasn't read it. <sighs> well, two, Sorry. technically, because I've never read any of it. <laughs> I got halfway through and then I had to stop for some reason. You're not was... included in this, Brian. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> it was really a great episode this week, and I'm excited to talk about it when someone finishes. Sorry. Yeah, take that two minutes out of your day, rather than check in Twitter or something. <laughs> okay. Take those two minutes out of your day and read it. I'm not going to lie, right? This week has been my finest week on Twitter. Like, if you're following me on Twitter, like, maybe don't bother now, because it sorry. doesn't get better. I think we all know what I'm talking about here. It was my Star Wars coffee shop. That was great. Of honestly, I, I've peaked, haven't I? I've peaked. It doesn't get any better than that. I I was writing it thinking this is my Sistine Chapel, so to speak, of of Twitter. And um, yeah, that's a little shameless self plug there. Go on over, read my coffee shop menu, and then your life will be complete, basically. But yeah, that's that's one of the reasons why I probably haven't read True Beauty, as I might have been doing that, but. I'll catch up, I promise, guys. Make sure you follow, like, and retweet. You're right. (laughs) (laughs) So moving on nicely, what's your jam? Far out, man. What's your jam? Shelby, you're up. Tell us, what's your jam? Okay, so... (laughs) Brace yourselves. It's not my jam, but it's a... It's a uh, something that you A-jab. need to listen to to understand where we are in this point of I don't know existence in in human existence. For the Aquaman movie, there is a song called "Oceans to Oceans," and it's by Pitbull, and it's a cover of Toto's Africa. And it's god awful. Oh, but <laughs> some people like it. No, and some and- people are like, I want to hate this. But I like it. I know, yeah, but they, no, it's but they, bad. That's, it's not. It's pretty good. bad. It's painful. But it it was making me think about how this is probably. I don't know. There's this new trend of everyone covering this song, and I wonder if it's gonna, you know, continue. Maybe this will eventually be one of the most covered songs if this trend keeps going. Yeah, but this isn't even a true cover. They just sing the chorus in between him rapping about nonsense yeah like i don't know mr worldwide yeah mr. and then he like worldwide. he like straight up steals a jay-z lyric too so just saying but <laughs> which one was that is it repeatable actually yeah wouldn't smash a grape <laughs> in a fruit fight it's from the i don't remember some jay-z song but mm-hmm. anyway oh. maybe that's like a common saying somewhere in yeah. miami isn't that where Pitbull i mean but is? would you do surgery on a grape i what I <laughs> You don't know that joke? <laughs> no. What? Oh my goodness, did neither of you even go on the internet ever? I try I'm sorry, not did to. you know this? Yeah. What is it? It's just a thing that went round about a week ago. Yeah, oh. it's basically talking about how it was always a thing that people were saying, and now we can do surgery on a grape. 
I don't know. It's basically you can peel back the skin and then put it back and manipulate what a grape is because you can be so delicate with it. And then it became like a big thing. You know, Um, like the moth on the light thing. Yeah. Yeah, It was a bit like that. It was crazy for like a week and then it went away. Yeah. Isn't that everything on the internet? (laughs) Yeah. Like, isn't that the definition of viral? Y'all missed it. Anyway, it was a great joke for the people who know it. It was an amazing joke, wasn't it, Phil? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, whatever. Thank you. Exactly. But Talking back, about good jokes. Back to, oh no. <laughs> do you want to do your good joke? Go ahead. Oh no. So if your mum is so fat that when she was in Hogwarts, the sorting hat had to put her in all four houses. Oh, <laughs> oh my god. <sighs> oh, okay, Carol, I'm no. excited he gets to I know. tell me. <laughs> <I> know. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> Oceans to Back Oceans to is a really to bad song, idea. but you should listen to it to appreciate how hilariously bad it is, is the story that I'm trying yeah. to tell. And here's, like, from my point of view, I took it to a really weird, like, philosophical place. And for me, <laughs> it is, like, a metaphor for DC versus Marvel. <laughs> Because DC comes out with this new movie, and they're like, yeah, we're going to pump this movie. Guess what we're going to use as publicity? Here's this song by Pitbull, and it's garbage. And you know what? <laughs> Their movies are usually garbage. <laughs> so it's You very feel true. really passionate yeah. about this. I do. You know, and it's sad, too, because I haven't even seen any of the DC movies. Like, I should I watch can... them so that I can I think say Uncle with Man's authority. Gonna be good. That, I think no, it's going to be good. No, dude, it's not. It's going to be bad. I'm going to go in not and even have... Look good. You know what? I hope... It's so bad that it's hilariously bad, just like this song. And I want to go no, see it. Okay, it does have that feel to it. It feels like it could be like so over the top, goofy, like, Maybe I don't even know, slapstick is... action movie that it could be good and as far as entertaining. Maybe this song that has no is chance exactly of being actually what this movie is going to be like. I hope Maybe. so. I do. Maybe it really is a metaphor. Who knows? Metaphor. What did you guys think of this song? It was, uh, to be honest... I loved it. <laughs> oh, my God. Go away. He did, <laughs> he did not. <laughs> <laughs> I was more grateful that what what happened was it started me on an internet spiral where I then listened to the original and I then listened to... I then watched an edit of the throne room scene from The Last Jedi with Africa covering over <laughs> nice. it. Nice. It was sublime. I'm, I'm not going to lie. It was really sublime. But I'm just struggling to see how this song fits with the movie. And, I, and like the ocean, I'm not. I'm not sure how the whole thing kind of links well, together. Well, you see, when you bless the rains yeah. down in Africa, they eventually the run into the ocean, and then is Aquaman is. is gonna rule ocean to ocean. Oh no, I don't okay. know. That's, well, the story is that the stretch. the yeah. war of the ocean is coming to land, and mm-hmm. so he's gonna do something to stop his. I guess half brother. Well, you're way more into Aquaman than I ever I watched imagined. the trailer. I watched one trailer. I did too, but I didn't pay that much attention. Well, I, I wanted to know the, what was... story they're trying to tell. I just assumed they don't tell stories in DC. Oh my gosh. You're blinded <laughs> by this hate. <laughs> Wonder Woman was good. Yes. It was uh, average. I... We're not getting into this conversation right now. What yeah. do you have? <laughs> <laughs> what do you have just... for your What's Your Jam? Yeah. We have something. Well, no, it's not we, is it? It's me because I've been. Um, well, sort is of you. BTS? We watched the Greatest is it Showman. Big Bang? Yeah, mm. we watched the Greatest Showman, which then led us to start listening to the Greatest Showman reimagined soundtracks. Which I don't know if they're. I don't know what's happening with your radios, but they're all over the radio at the moment because Pink covered. Basically, the people want to sell the CD for Christmas. Yeah, basically. Or the download, I don't know what yeah. people get nowadays. Um, I mean, it's a little bit one of these things of like, are we fiddling with something that's not not broken, maybe? Um, but I have got a heavy, heavy kind of Hugh Jackman, Zaka from Bias going or like running in the background here. So just bear with me on this. But we've got Pink covered A Million Dreams. Panic at the Disco did The Greatest Show and Amory and James Arthur, who's like some Burke who won X Factor over here, um, covered Rewrite the Stars. Um, that's all I think that are out They're the ones that are on our radio. Oh, no, Panic at the Disco isn't even on our radios at the moment, is it? Which is annoying because that's probably the best one. It makes um, sense. Like, that's like... Yeah, that that seems like something that would be right roots, up their alley. Yeah. Is this it, cabaret. It did actually, yeah. I, I was really into that one, actually. I did like that. I'm going to um, have to check that out. I'm intrigued. Pink and a Million Dreams. Uh, Her daughter that, sings the, yeah. the young girl's part and then she sings the other part and it's very good. 
Yeah, it was a good. It is a good cover. Okay, no. Rewrite no, 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 that's the, the next stars. One. I'm not on that one yet. I'm on a million dreams. <laughs> <laughs> I do miss the um, like man singing it because there is something about Hugh Jackman coming in on a million dreams, which I really enjoy. Um, because you, you start Deadpool with the young kids singing. You're Hugh Jackman. I just think the man's talented, <laughs> um, especially at this sort of thing. Um, but yeah, Pink's version was good, and like you say, it was pretty cute with her daughter coming in. And then Amory and James Arthur, like like I've said, James Arthur's a bit of a douche to be honest. I'm not a fan of him, and he's no Zac Efron. Amory Who was is? really really good, <laughs> exactly right. Uh, yeah, Amory was good. It should have probably been Amory and Zac Efron, maybe not to like do Zendia out of her part because she was still pretty good she was average and he was Zac Efron just carries it all (laughs) he's just so good but anyway yes The Greatest Showman reimagined it was um, I'd leave Zac Efron you'd leave me for Zac Efron that's what I mean yeah Yeah. I felt like that was where this was going I'd probably I wouldn't leave Zac Efron for you that's what I was going (laughs) Oh I'd be fine with that. So, so are, could, like, come and hang did you guys out. hear that Hugh Jackman's going to be doing a tour of? Yes. Guys... One of my staff um, <laughs> at work bought tickets in Birmingham, Alabama. No, in Birmingham, England, and she wasn't very happy with her seats because they were near the back. So then she bought tickets in London as well and spent like over two hundred quid. Murder. And she's going to see him twice. And I said you should sell one set, and she's like, no, I'm not going to sell one set. I'm going to see him twice. Out? I guess so. I was going to say, I would, I'd actually probably go and see that. Unless it's just going to be him performing the song. Is it going to be the whole thing done as a musical? No, it's him singing various yeah, West him End singing. songs. It's him it? singing yeah. stuff from Greatest Showman, from Les Mis. Les Mis, yeah. Probably Oklahoma. Uh, uh, I mean, I'd go. I'd go, where he does a bit of tap dance. I'd go say, yeah, if someone like, gave uh, yeah. me tickets. I would never buy them. I'd buy them it's if they were much. under 100 bucks. I would be like, yeah, let's go. Yeah, because it's... It's nice to go to like London every now and then, isn't it? Get dressed up, go to the West End. I West go to St Paul's girls. Cathedral. Who knows? Maybe London oh. will come to you one day. Well, oh. it's interesting, oh, don't, don't. isn't it? Wow. <laughs> well Did you see done. What we did there? Thank you. Thank you. So that's um yeah, that's my that's been my jam this week. No K pop, see. Well, it's K pop, obviously, but I'm not going to talk about it because I don't want to be that guy. Next up, we have Netflix and Chill. Netflix and Chill. So, I'm going in first here. I watch The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, which is two hours and 13 minutes long. What? Tell us about it, Phil. Is it a film? It's kind of a film, yes, but it's lots of sort of short stories, approximately 15 to 20 minutes long each. I put into uh, Google Netflix Hidden Gems. And it was a suggestion. I thought, well, I've got two hours and 13 minutes to spare. I might as well watch it. Mm. And the first one was really good. There's about th- probably four. I think there were seven stories. Four out of seven stories were really good. Some of them were probably probably a bit too much for me, you know. Uh-huh. Sometimes I just want to sit back and not take too much attention to what's going on. What are you saying? They're quite heavy. Mm, they have a purpose and a point. It's the Cohen brothers. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. I think and that's one of the ones they tried to put in theater so they could be... Like oh yeah, I think so. Considered for yeah, nominations, thanks. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> yeah, you could kind of see what they were going, but the ones that were a little bit more funny and had a bit more humour behind them definitely resonated. Good word with me <laughs> better uh, than Very the insightful. serious ones. And it was, and it was. I was just like sat there at one point, like oh god, let's just. I hope this hurries up and we can get on to the next story. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, it's very clever, really well shot, and and yeah, you could you, there's some twists in some of the stories, but you could see them, you could see the twist coming. It wasn't that like oh wow, um, but yeah, it was good, and it did make me chuckle a couple of times. And the first fifteen minutes in particular is worth watching because the uh, Mister Scruggs himself is very very amusing. Oh, okay. So yeah, nice. I would, I would recommend watching it if you. Think, hmm, what should I watch? Give it a look. And then I've also started watching Saving Private Ryan. Oh. Started. Yeah. Just couldn't couldn't I watched hack the it first, or what? Oh, I watched the first half an hour and just got really sad. <laughs> Ended up thinking about my granddad and what they had to go through and thinking, 
it seems quite the first half an hour seems very realistic to actually what the war was like and getting onto the beaches in like Normandy. I was gonna say, what is it? Is it D Day landings? No, three. There's four brothers. Three of them have died, and there's a band of people going in to save a uh, Private Ryan, basically. Oh, I see. And but the opening scene is they go onto the beach and then they get the orders to go and get him. Oh. I'm about an hour in, and so there's about four hours left probably because <laughs> <laughs> it is quite long. Probably one of my favorite war movies. Yeah, it's I think pretty universally acclaimed for being, like you said, pretty realistic for the way that things happened and just yeah, it's one of those movies that's just good. Like I was, actually, I was just angles. having one of those days where I was mm-hmm. thinking, yeah, I definitely need to watch something a bit more lighthearted because <laughs> this is just going to make me really sad. Right. That- Thinking about all the poor, like, 19, 18 year old boys that just wasted their lives fighting for nonsense. <laughs> is that, well. They were fighting no, for a good cause, say, yeah. but it was caused in nonsense <laughs> yeah, because yeah. human beings are terrible people. Yeah. Yeah. I've always said, but I feel like. I feel like we need a good alien invasion just to sort of give us. We need a good alien invasion. Do you know what I mean? Like, just let's have some perspective and realize that, yeah, we're all the same. Is that why you put a million ways to die in the West on as well, then, for a bit of lighthearted? <laughs> <laughs> we won't dive into that. There's no, there's nothing insightful about that film at all. So <laughs> it's interesting because uh, my Netflix and chill at the end of it, which was a very abrupt end, it recommended. Ballad of Buster Scruggs as the next thing to watch. So definitely on our list, but we finished the Kaminsky method. Talk about heavy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like it was heavy, but also funny. I don't know. Mm. If you like Grace and Frankie, I would say definitely watch this because it, I mean, the common thread is it's about old people yeah, and the, they're the, funny. Yeah, the older generation, what, what you kind of do after, because the middle age is kind of what most shows concentrate on. And you don't get a lot of, like, main characters being old. You'll have a lot of, you know, grandfather characters and things like that that come up. So it's interesting that it centers on the next step in our age. Right. And you can't have a show with your main characters being that age without talking about death. Right, yeah, I mean. And most people don't like to talk about death, and they don't like to think about it in ways that are funny or ways that are amusing or just (laughs) more normal instead of it being, like, this awful tragedy when... I mean, when you're that age, you just, I mean, that's the age where you start to die, not from tragic deaths, but just because you're old. Yeah. That's, and, I always remember I used to go over to my Nana's house and she'd always go through the obituaries just to see if anyone she knew died. It was just like a routine yeah. thing. It wasn't like a somber thing or anything. It was just kind of like, and she'd get to one, she'd be like, oh, okay. And just, I mean, it's just the way it, it's kind of like looking to see if anyone you knew was in the paper for winning the lottery or something. Yeah. <laughs> but it's it's a good show. I would say don't expect too much development because it's really short. It's oddly short and the episodes are short. They're about 22 to 25 minutes. And I think there's seven or eight. I think it was eight. I can't I think remember. It was eight. But we got to that one and it was... It just ended. Yeah, we were just waiting for the next episode to start because it had no feeling of finality or anything. It didn't feel like the end. It felt like the middle part of a series and the next episode was going to carry on the story and then there just weren't anymore. And then it said Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Yeah. (laughs) Overall, I think it's a really good show. I would highly recommend it. I hope that they're doing a second season. I don't know if they are yet. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, The acting's phenomenal, though. Um, Yeah, it's worth watching. Good stuff. Pretty heavy. And Cried a couple times. <laughs> once we're once we're done recording today, we're actually going to finish watching Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, the Christmas special. Nice. It's so far, we're halfway through. Christmas. <laughs> we're halfway through, and it's really good. It's actually a continuation of the story from where we left off in the last season, and I think they're taking it in a good direction. I was really scared it was going to be a clip show or something reflective. Yeah, I thought for sure it was going to be that or like just some, I don't know. A storyline that doesn't matter at all, but so far it definitely seems to matter. Yeah, I, I don't think you can skip this and then go into the second season. I, Not it filler. It sounds like, yeah, this might actually be important. So, fun. No, that's on our radar, isn't it, to get stuck into that one? Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that leads nicely on to the locker room. <laughs> L- 
listen up, sports fans. It's time for the locker room. So, big news. Um, sorry. <clears throat> Hello there, this is Jay Jarrison of uh, the locker room for the Ports and Ends <laughs> podcast. Today we have some big news coming in from the United Kingdom. <laughs> Wiltshire, the county of Wiltshire in England, played the county of Oxfordshire in England. <laughs> Uh, and one of the hosts, sorry, one of the hosts, Phil, was playing for Wiltshire, and they ended up winning. So now they're in the quarterfinals. Boom. Uh, so we now have fantastic. to play <laughs> Devon, who beat Dorset by Ooh, one shot. Ooh, Devon are good. Uh, if we'd have played Dorset, it would have been really awkward because that was my old county before I moved to Wiltshire. I was going to say, yeah, yeah, wasn't that your old? Um, but we're playing squad. Devon. Devon are very good, but we've got a good chance. We've got a good team ethic. We've got a good team structure. We're we're fighting. If you check out, uh, it's on Facebook somewhere. If you put in Five Rivers Bowls Club, you can see a photograph of the young lads that we all play with. <laughs> the Moon Rakers. The Moon Rakers. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and in more news, Tottenham are through to last 16 of the Champions League. The draw is Monday, and they went to Barcelona. For any soccer fans out there, Barcelona are one of the best teams in the Europe. Um, and they managed to get a draw, which put them through to the next round. So, congratulations is to that, Tottenham. Is that because, hold on, reference from last week, Lionel Messi isn't all that great, yeah? He only played 20 minutes. Well, still, he should have been able to do a lot more in 20 minutes, right? Just saying. And that's all we have from the locker room today. So now we are going on to the Silver Screen main event... All right, ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats for the silver screen. Dun, 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 dun. Mortal Engines, or The Mortal Engines. Uh, I think it's Mortal Engines, isn't it? Yeah, no, the, no, the articles need not apply. <laughs> they are simply Mortal Engines. This is really fresh in our minds. We Yeah, we watched, just watched it. We just watched it. We went to the 10.30 a.m. showing, and I have to say... Going to a 10.30 a.m. movie was amazing. Yeah, it was... I'd never been to a movie, I don't think, before, like, three. I think I've been to a one, one o'clock, but never anything before noon. Yeah, it was uh, it was pretty cool just to rock up and... I went to um, Back to the Future 25th anniversary at 9 a.m. in the morning. Mm-hmm. I sat, nice. in, sat in the cinema, was the only person in there, and they didn't play the film because they didn't think they sold any tickets. So I had to go back into the foyer and say, I've been sat in here 15 minutes waiting for the film to start. <laughs> and uh, they said, oh, oh, we didn't realise. Oh, let, let, let's get you a coffee. So they got me a coffee and then I went in and watched the film all by myself. It was literally the best thing ever. That sounds awesome. So yeah. yeah was there, was it busy? Coffee machine, no, but the coffee machine was down and that was very oh, disappointing. Yeah, was Shelby times. was uh, very let down. So we had the uh, Atlantean coffee, Coca-Cola. <laughs> Yes, we did. (laughs) Probably did the trick. Yeah. But it was a really good movie, and I enjoyed watching it at early in the morning. Yeah. I I was stoked for this one. Um, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I just finished reading the book, actually, this morning. So I finished the book. He finished the last page while we were in the parking lot. Nice. (laughs) I did. She drove so I could finish reading. And I finished the book, walked into the movie, and saw it, and it was just like, Mortal Engines Mayhem. It was terrific. <laughs> so what were your guys' initial opinions? Sophie, have you read the book? Not yet, no. No, I think I'm the only one. You're the only one, Brian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm the only book snob, I so want I get to. to be that guy. You can, I get yes. to do the, well, actually. Well, actually, in the book. Well, like this. <laughs> um, I loved the CGIs Excellent. for the world itself. I just loved it, the whole thing. And Good. it was amazing it being like London. <laughs> yeah. So many places in it were exactly like London. Really? We should actually, yeah, we should probably like, taught say them, this Like is... when they went into like the subway to get down to the lower... The underground, yeah. The reaches. Tottenham Court Station is a station in the, right yeah. in the centre of London. There were lots of little touches and that the were tire, still... And like, the white tiles with the green is exactly what it's like. It was amazing. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. There were a lot of things. I mean, you, you have these sort of obligatory... Um, red phone box, didn't you? I'm surprised there wasn't a bus going around or something, but maybe they thought, oh, we'll keep it. But even the yeah, two... They, they don't have buses anymore. <laughs> yeah. The two lions. The two at lions the at the front of... Um, they're obviously, like, supersized from uh, Trafalgar, Trafalgar Square. Square and stuff like that. And obviously St. Paul's um, and the fact that 
St Paul's yeah. still stood. So yeah, there were there were a few things dotted around that were quite fun as like people who've been to London um, to see, and it was I think quite apt as well that it was the bad guy because that's you know I didn't see it as the bad guy. <laughs> I was rooting for London the whole time. Were you? <laughs> yeah. You're the only person on London's side. Well, the <laughs> idea that London is eating up other cities Europe, right, and like, other places around the world. Yeah. That it's Hashtag sort of, colonialism. Exactly. Kind of barreling across Europe. It was just like, yeah, I'm really I'm So do you think, convinced. let's go deep early, do you think that they based it on it being London because London has very iconic like uh, architecture and places and people go oh london yeah i've seen that in pictures if even if they've not been to london where if they'd have chosen a different city Hmm. it might not have been as recognizable or is it like you said because colonialism one Hmm. back in the day we used to rule the world well girls girls try to (laughs) well we did. Uh, okay, let's not like. Quite a lot of the world was owned by the I UK. I know, but and also then... you could argue the Roman Empire was just as big. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One was longer, wasn't it? I feel like one was bigger and one was longer. I can't remember what way around it is. But that's fine. Yeah. We won't have an argument about that on this podcast. I'd we'll argue... wait till we finish. But... <laughs> I'd argue New York. <laughs> you know, usually these things happen in New York, don't they? And so I was mildly surprised that it wasn't going to be, you know, if there was going to be a city you know, that a film is based around, you'd think New York. So I was mildly surprised that they didn't go that way. Um, And yeah, as a Brit, I found it quite fun that it was London. Um, The only other one could have been Paris with a little Eiffel Tower poking up out of the top. I could have been into that (laughs) as well. I feel like New York in itself doesn't really want to eat up anything else. New Mm. York is like, we're New York and you're not. Yeah. (laughs) New York doesn't want to to own anything else in my opinion it, new york is all about being itself mm-hmm. and i think a lot of american cities are like that except for maybe la la could definitely be sold to me as a city that eats other cities mm-hmm. but otherwise i mean there's also the concept of the united states having to traverse huge spans of ocean is probably too much well, yeah i think it yeah. was more of a logistical thing that they had it be london because then they can go and like work their way through Europe and hit to that Eastern stronghold Mm. situation. Whereas if it was an American city, you would have to really remake the map for them to get anywhere other than America. Like (laughs) you could do like LA trying to come eat New York, which would be kind of funny for (laughs) honestly, like LA versus New York level. But yeah, I think it speaks to a wider audience to use the locales they did. And I don't know. I don't know if uh, Philip Reeve, the author, is English or American. I don't no, know. I that don't might know. have a lot to do with it, too. Potentially. I also got me thinking, actually, I mean, I don't know if this is elaborated on in the books, or whether it will be. Um, I actually thought, what did all this originate in America? You know, is America even still standing at this point? Um, it's sort of it's its absence from any kind of reference made me think Ooh, is it is it not okay over there or something so i don't know if some of the problems originated over there and there's actually like no america anymore i don't know um although she had an american accent didn't she the main actress hester hester She, I'm pretty sure she kept her American accent, I think. So I don't know whether there was or not. But it got me wondering, like, yeah, what's the state of the rest of the globe if this is what's going on with, like, Europe and Asia? Um, how's everybody else doing? Well, they, in the books, go on an expedition to America. Oh. And you saw it in the movie. They they saw the relics from America was the two stupid minions. Oh, the, oh the my American gosh, deities. yes. deities. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, they, they do that in the book, too. They talk about how, you know... Th- everything gets destroyed in the 60 minute war and then they the archaeologists start digging things up and they're trying to form their ideas of the ancients based on what they find so they thought mickey mouse was a deity because they found all these great big statues of mickey mouse so they're like well this guy must have been really important it's interesting things like that yeah but i i also was looking at all of that where they're trying to understand things from the ancients which is what they call the ancient ones in horizon zero dawn and they talk about all these weird things that they used to do and they start talking about literal coffee mugs and they have all these ideas of what they used them for (laughs) and the main character at one point says maybe they just 
drank out of them and they're like oh no no (laughs) that simple that's ridiculous but yeah it it is fun to kind of like i don't know it's it's like poking fun at ourselves really to think of how we'll be looked at in you know centuries to come but yeah the 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 joke about the screens yeah that was just gonna say yeah the the screen screen era yeah the screen age that was it (laughs) that is literally the age we are in we have bronze age stone age screen age i've just, I checked. just looked it up he's oh. from england yeah <laughs> he is from england lives in dartmoor at the moment that's not that's he not was born in yeah brighton oh cute brighton's fun cute <laughs> <laughs> brighton's fun but that wouldn't be going on a rampage anytime soon so he did pick right with london didn't he yeah i i have to admit i loved the uh the whole I loved the concept of this film. I was hooked really, really early on. Sometimes it takes me... When I go in completely cold, I hadn't even seen a trailer for this film or anything. And so I was... Oh, wow, that's cool. Yeah. So I was totally cold going into this. And it normally takes me a little while to kind of get into the feel of things. But I very, very quickly loved the concept of this. Like, when you first see... Um, you know, like these city- cities on wheels really doesn't do this justice, but you know, these kind of, <laughs> you know, these moving cities and then this moving little town. And, you know, initially I was thinking, are we going to get some Mad Max vibes going on here? Um, but I think it really it established itself as very much its own original thing. It was, a, I thought it was a very original concept, um, mm-hmm. which I was really into as well. You know, you have these plucky little towns kind of zipping around and then you just have like, the Goliath of London coming along and like, and it was literally like begin ingestion or something like that. And I was yeah. like, oh, uh-huh. it's so visceral, you know. It's Take like... the shot, like it's yeah. it's hunting. Yeah, yes. that's what that's what they refer to it as in the yeah. book. It, they they England or London rather had been stuck in its own little island. They crossed the land bridge into the hunting grounds yeah. for the first time, and everyone's like, ooh, what are we gonna do? And the whole idea is that the the prey, the smaller towns, are all being, you know, hunted to extinction. And it's only the big ones left, and they don't want to mess with each other. So everyone's kind of hiding. And then London sort of comes out of hiding. It's like a big deal. And you see all the people, like, cheering on because they haven't done this for a while. Yeah. But it was cool. Yeah, I was, I was into it as a as a concept overall. Um, I thought it was it was really cool. And there's sort of there's hints of this massive world and this massive history that's going on there. You know, like with the sixty second war and everything. Mm-hmm. But you're not. Um, there was I didn't think there was info dumping. In fact, I was left wanting a lot more from this afterwards. But like in a good way. You know, I didn't feel um, unfulfilled at the end of it. I felt I had all the information I needed to enjoy the film. But it's left me going like, yeah, maybe I will pick up the books or I hope there is another film because, you know, I'd love to know more about the war or about, you know, there was just so much that was left unsaid that I think was really, really good. And it starts your quest for the expanded universe. Yes, right. (laughs) I want to know everything now. Same, same. Well, there are five total books. So Mm. I think it's a four part series specifically about i guess hester and tom Mm -hmm. and then there's a a fifth book that's just kind of out there in the ether so i'm definitely going to get on board because i enjoy like you said the world is terrific this is one of my favorite new ips that i've encountered in the last i don't know probably decade i loved that the prison thing was like going through the water too yes yes serious azkaban vibes there of like yeah on a stormy sea but then Ask it was walking. Man, Alcatraz, all that stuff. Yeah. All kinda... What did you all think of the, I suppose, you know, we've got the world here. What did you all think of the characters then? All right. I bawled like a baby. <laughs> <laughs> when, what's his name again? Shrike. Shrike. Yeah, <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah. They did him wonderfully. He was scary to start off with. There was an actual... If I were small, I'd be so scared. Yeah, I had a little, like, flutter with those sort of the glowing eye. I mean, can someone sort of help me out a bit with, like, what was he exactly? Was he like a cyborg? Um, Yes. Yeah? Is that okay? Because I was a little unclear at one point where I was like, how much of him is organic and how much was... It's basically just like his head and everything else is a machine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 
they're uh they called him i think the the lazarus squad That's, or something yeah, like I liked that. that and then the resurrected men and they also referred to him as stalkers in the books i don't remember if they said that they in the did. movie or not they did okay so yeah they kind of went with three different nomenclatures there for him but yeah he was supposedly the last one still functioning mm. and it was interesting the way they did it in the movie versus the book it was similar but not the same like Shrike had kind of decided to let Hester go. Okay. And then the uh the technology and stuff was a lot different in the book. The it was actually Chrome was the the head bad guy and Valentine was kind of like his lap dog. Right. And then they figured out the technology to do the resurrected ones again. They started making their own. And they're like, Hey Shrike, we know that you really like Hester. And you want to stop her pain and suffering. So if you go find her and kill her and bring her back, we'll make her a resurrected one for you. And you guys can live together forever. Wouldn't that be fun? I get it now. And he was like, okay, I'll do that. Lazarus. As in like the miracle of. Mm -hmm. uh, mm. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So we're actually, we are meant to interpret that as that he loved her. He loved it. Because I didn't know if it was more like a. He he raised her as a daughter and therefore uh, therefore it was kind of a father daughter relationship vibe going on there or do we think he actually sort of loved her as i think a... it's both yeah, yeah. I, I i don't think i think he loved her as a companion okay not like a i don't know not th- the creepy kind. yeah i don't think it was like it a was weird like a... possessive mm. thing i mean they're 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 putting forth this idea that those that are these cyborgs these resurrected men they don't have true feelings yeah they're just supposed to be weapons they're, they were made as soldiers yeah so they have feelings of I care about you and however facet whatever facet that is. And I, I took it as whenever he realizes that she loves Tom, his whole point was to make her happy and make her not well, not make not her happy, but make her him. not sad. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Not broken. That yeah. was his whole thing. He collected these broken dolls and things yeah. and was trying to fix them. He couldn't fix hester so he was going to like unmake her so that he could put her back together in a way that she wouldn't be she wouldn't have the capacity to be sad and depressed anymore so she would be fixed in a Mm -hmm. manner of speaking which is interesting there's so much greek mythology name dropping in this hester the idea of hester being maybe potentially like hestia which is the goddess of the hearth which you would light something whenever a new city or a new domestic place was was founded, which is interesting because we're talking about cities and and all Municipal of that. Municipal Darwinism, baby. Yeah. <laughs> and so, what did um, what did you think of Hester? Then, speaking of of her, like, what did everyone make of her as a character? I mean, I loved her. I thought she was everything that I wanted her to be, and I don't think that her affection for Tom ever lessened her character. No. And it made sense. Like, the progression of her warming up to him made sense. It wasn't like, oh, all of a sudden I've met this boy and now I'm in love and I'm no longer yeah. cold and heartless. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, I never actually even felt that she was... Um, I know when you... Fit her introduction, yes, she does seem quite cold. But actually, she she was always quite... There was a fire underneath her the whole time um, mm-hmm. that I really liked. I actually, like, from a quite a, a shallow level, I I really liked that her her scar was was very vivid um and it was it's it's quite a an ugly scar and i don't know sometimes there's a temptation isn't there in in films to you know you have this sort of um dashing scar that runs across you you know and it's of they make it quite dainty and quite pretty whereas i was like this was a a heck of a wound that she got and the fact that they kept it there but there's obviously you know she's she was still a beautiful person and obviously you know Tom felt that attraction towards her and I just I don't know I really appreciated that she wasn't your conventional heroine so to speak which I I really liked she was a very complicated character um sometimes she was a bit of an ass to him and sometimes he was a bit of an ass to her you know it's just they were both I felt they were quite all quite real characters very human which um which I enjoyed did you did you like Hester Phil you've been uncharacteristically quiet <laughs> I'm all about Anna White, Anna Fang. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. Fang. Okay. Oh, yeah. She That's was it. just brilliant. I literally lent into Phil, didn't I? And I was like, Phil, I can feel I'm getting obsessed with her already. And she's only been on the screen for like 10 minutes. I was just, that entrance, 
for a character. Oh yeah, she just <gasps> rocks up with the sunglasses. The sunglasses. Oh, and the, the sunglasses coat. were amazing. Yeah, the red hair. And I just, yeah, I'm, I'm feeling her I'm, hair, yeah. like everything about her. Loved. And that, for me, one of the standout moments in the film was when she has that blade in the back of her boot, and she just did that like kind of crescent kick thing a scorpion kick isn't it over her head into the dude's forehead i was like oh my god that's so badass yeah. i like when she shoots the first guy and you just see his toupee like yeah. <laughs> 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 oh yeah i was a big fan what was her nickname again it was wind song oh. windflower oh sorry windflower. windflower yeah that was she was just so good and again she i thought she was a really good example of like like not spoon feeding us you know you we were allowed to kind of jump to the conclusion I, I thought there was definitely something with with her and the other guy I never caught his name actually the other pilot where there were like moments between them of so many like unspoken words where they kind of look at each other and you're like yeah there's history there there's something but we didn't need to know um so they just sort of kept it at that and yeah she was she was by far my favorite character I have to say. So was she your favourite as well, Phil? Yeah. I was yeah. slightly disappointed with Catherine Valentine. I didn't really yeah. didn't get that so much the point of her apart from being pretty and blonde. Well, I wanted more of her though. Like yeah. I found her compelling. And okay, I was like, see, give us more. I kind of thought that she was there and she's like, Oh, she's Tom's love interest. Yeah, that was fun how they twisted that quite and quickly. And then it was like, okay, so that's but she's not, yeah. And then I was like What's the point in that? What's next? Yeah. yeah. Okay, she's just the she's just Valentine's like connection on this earth and he's gonna basically betray her as well and Yeah. He doesn't care for anyone. But I didn't really understand like get the point and she didn't it felt that like the story was built quite a lot that she was involved in, but wasn't actually involved in anything really apart from the end where Yeah. She put the brakes on. Yeah. Or opened the so should we Course. have a bit of like book knowledge here then, Brian? Like what? Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> that, this is <laughs> chomping at the <laughs> my, my biggest complaint, uh, book v movie, is Catherine because she basically could have been taken out of the movie, as you say, mm. and it would have made very little difference. But she is a huge thread throughout the novel. I mean it basically goes back and forth uh, between points of view from talking about Tom and Hester and then talking about Catherine and then Bevis Pod, the guy that is basically not even there. He vanished. He he? plays a huge role in the book. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Catherine and Bevis are sort of the in town version of what Tom and Hester are in the book. They're much, much more important. And, it was just funny to me that they, they included the uh, the cat's cradle, the little secret staircase. Yeah. And she got in there and they saw what they were doing. And then you didn't see her again for like half an hour. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, I think they kind of really wanted her to be part of the movie, but they couldn't find a way to work it out. I don't know. It was, I agree, pretty awkward. She was a bit disappointing and not for any fault of her own, just because she kind of got the short straw, I guess, in the adaptation. Yeah. Yeah, I reckon there were there were a lot that could have been, you know, cut. I think she was sort of a victim of the cutting room, so to speak. And I, I felt there was a lot yeah, of potential there. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised there. if that's true. Yeah. And actually, if we're sort of... Because I was going to say, oh, let's have some like cons at the end, but actually like, I don't want to finish on a downer because there's so much I loved about this film. But I think my main niggle, like, like Phil said, apart from Catherine, was actually... Um, Valentine himself, the the dad. Um, can't quite remember his first name, Thaddeus or something like Thaddeus, that. Yeah, yeah Thaddeus. So. It was like he criticised in Hugo Weaving only mildly, only only very his mildly. His acting was first class. He, yeah, so he was he was great. I think my that was my only complaint with the film was sort of how. What was his I, motivation? What was his motive like? I found that he went from being like, I was like, oh my gosh, like it's her dad and he's doing this and this could be really like, really interesting. And he, you could have gone from the whole London is fighting for its survival, right? It's out there in these these wastes. And then you, you come to the wall and you see behind the wall, there's clearly hints that there's a bountiful land behind it. And you've got London kind of fighting it out in the plains and chomping up other towns and stuff. And had it have been more of a, I'm doing this for London's survival and it was kind of a, 
you know, it was that kind of fight. It was, we're fighting for our lives here, where he then ended up becoming like a just twirling moustache, you know, a moustache twirling villain of, <laughs> I'm doing this for the power. <laughs> yes, exactly. I almost thought he was going to cackle at one point, And I just thought they you could have had the potential to have something really quite powerful there of, you know, even if when London lost, you'd be like, oh, but, you know, they were only trying to stay alive. Um it could have been a bit, and then that could have been quite powerful again with Catherine. And so I think that was my only complaint was sort of his, how his motive shifted. Because I loved the like background plotting and even taking out like the mayor and stuff like that. And then he just towards the end got a little bit, um, yeah, cackling, cackling villain as Hugo Weaving's characters are wont to do, to be fair. Maybe it's him. Maybe he just goes there. He's like, no, I want all the power of my character. <laughs> But yeah, I think that was my only my only real gripe actually was him. And what did you guys think of him as a character? I really liked him as an, an evil guy, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you you see it kind of placed there. And I I really appreciated him being a man of the people in so many so many people in London's eyes. They all viewed him as this really great guy. And all he, that propaganda. He, works, and he stuff. Yeah. works very hard to do that, especially showing mercy to the man they just took in that they were starting to beat oh you know make sure he's fined for this and i don't know i appreciate that they show him putting such effort into making sure he looks like a good guy yeah yeah i liked all that at the start and actually because he came from a slightly lower i love how even after all this time london's still like obsessed with classes as well and like (laughs) (laughs) do you know what i mean like just can't shake that off and like he was he didn't actually come from he sort of had risen the ranks a bit because I think they the mayor kind of threw it in his face a little bit, didn't he? Um, which I did. I bought you up. I can. Yeah, I can sort of take this yeah. away from you again. Which yeah, I did. I did really enjoy. He was yeah, he was very cool and I see he was very well played. I just just towards the end, I had my my little niggle with him. He didn't feel like the people behind the wall were non negotiable. No, I it felt like you could go and speak to him and say, "We're going to do this." <laughs> I've killed the the old dude, whatever his name was. The mayor. Yeah, the mayor. Yeah. yeah, and so Crone. we're all gonna. That's quite fun. We're as all well. gonna. We're all gonna negotiate. Uh, we're gonna negotiate. And we're gonna come and live behind a wall. Yeah, but, I, I quite liked that. London still has a mayor as well. Actually, that was quite a fun yeah, little London reference. Well. Yeah, I feel like he's a famous someone as well. I couldn't place him, but we'll have to look him up later. And actually, that was something you were saying, Shelby, about um, the Greek mythology re- references and the fact that the sort of obviously the main weapon is the Medusa. Um, mm-hmm. And it came I, out of Pandora's box. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah, really, really <laughs> cool. So, and actually, I suppose we haven't covered Tom. Like, what do we? All, what do everyone think of Tom? I thought at times his acting was a little bit weak. Like, oh wow! As the actor. Okay. But I did enjoy his character, and he mm. was funny in parts, which was good. And yeah, he had a good, like, good character development through the film. So yeah. it was nice. Yeah, I like that archaeologists are like somebody's in it. Not that they're not somebody's now. Like obviously archaeologists are still cool, in it, but they were like really, really important in this society, obviously because of the things they're finding. And um, yeah, I thought he was cool. He had like a Newt Scamander vibe, I think. Without that's probably being... why I was a little. Yeah, bit... I was gonna say probably. <laughs> 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 I'm a little, little, little bit not into it. But... A little bit appreciated... foppish, yeah. <laughs> I appreciated that he didn't take away from Hester. Yeah, he did a good job of being a really good supporting role without taking it over and it didn't feel forced in the way that, oh no, he's not important, but he's kind of important. I I think they did a good job at putting him exactly where he needed to be in the story. And they were really good together as well. I loved that scene when he, he doesn't leave her on that, um, on that vehicle that looks like a little scuttlebug thing. And she's like, why didn't you leave me? And he's like, oh, I, I couldn't leave you behind. And she's like, why? I would have left you. <laughs> yeah. like, it was so cold. And I believe at that moment as well, I really did believe her. Yeah, I'm yes. pretty sure at that point in the story, she would have yeah. left him. It, it wasn't until a little later. And maybe because he didn't leave her, yes. it kind of changed. I- I think that was a turning point. Him. Yeah. It's yeah. definitely by the time Fang comes along and Fang's like ditch the dude and she's right. like, No, I can't now, kind of thing. Um yeah. When and the you... fact that they Oh, go ahead, Phil. No, you carry on. <laughs> the fact that they pointed out multiple times so that it didn't go into that trope of, Oh, now we're sharing sad stories, this is the part where we do that. Mm. She even says, We're not going to share our sad stories, we're not doing this. Yeah. 
I think that was a good way to make sure it didn't seem like that typical. Well, this is that lull in the action where they go into their backstory and yeah, know. yeah, it was kind exactly. of actually yeah, mm. yeah. Mm. And she kind of told her story when she was ready to tell it as well, because I'm pleased she did tell him the whole stuff with Shrike, because obviously it meant we got to see it as well. Um, but yeah, you, you're right, Shelby. I think their their relationship kind of happened very very naturally, um, and they seem they seem very much. Uh, equals in this i think from a um like from a girl's perspective here it was it was cool to see these these sort of female characters who were really up there in the forefront of things and they were really driving the narrative forward um and i really really appreciated that it's something that we just um we just don't get to see and i was i was really pretty but at the same time they didn't really fall into these um tropes of that sometimes female characters can get in like i said that's why I like that Hester wasn't um she wasn't all nice all the time, you know. Sometimes she yeah, she'd kinda of lash out at people and she'd say stuff and I just I really appreciate that. And it's the same with Fang as well. I thought there was a lot more to her and she was um she she drove such a huge part. And at one point I was like Oh, when they were coming into London at the end, and it's like Hester's been dropped off and Fang's been dropped off, and I was like, Oh right, so the girls are dealing with this one then. That's great, you know. Yeah, and whenever she it. gets her injury, mm-hmm. he doesn't have to truly save her. I mean, she yeah. she figures it out. Yes, which kind of just grins and bears it, really. It never properly gets... I feel like I feel like Anna did a little bit to help her, but she pretty much was like, well, I'll just have to get on with this then, which was cool. Yeah, like you say, there was no sort of rescuing going on, which is... Um, I'm, I'm, always, I'm always a fan of, to be honest. And I thought the scary scientist lady as well was she was super creepy. Wasn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, what? She's the one that makes the the new resurrected men in the book. Oh, okay. Oh, I could see that. I could totally see that. I kept waiting for him to show up, but they never did. She gives you that, you know, Nazi doctor vibe. Yes. Yeah. She's very much mad scientist y, yeah. Uh huh. I did kind but of Yeah, get in the it it's, it's 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 pretty like dreadful in the book. They they take basically slave labor prisoners and work them until they die and then they give them to her to turn into resurrected wow <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, yeah i wondered what happened to all the people who got um ingested by london i did wonder how that's all gonna pan out for them because it must be it's more mouse to feed isn't it? i was gonna say it can't be a good thing them taking them in. you know i know he made it out to be like oh welcome to london everybody you know and you're like but they were taken there against their will and they were trying to not be taken there. So I I, I got the feeling that it wasn't um yeah. wasn't pleasant for the people who arrived in London. I don't think they'd be you know. Yeah, up, I think up they there. all they all end up in the gut where yeah. they have to feed the stuff into the machines and do all the grunt work and the yeah, not good. Not good stuff. <laughs> well, Brian finished the last page of the book before we go in and he goes, Well, that was bleak. <laughs> yeah and i'm like oh i'm so excited to see this movie now <laughs> it's so good though but yeah i'm honestly really curious how the story is going to continue because at the end of the book basically everyone is dead except for tom and hester wow so it's a bit different than the end of the movie where there's there's hope for the londoners and you know Catherine's mm. still alive and bevis is still alive and uh, a couple of the pilots are still there but yeah and interesting too one of the other big things that's different that didn't really make that much difference um except for the furthering of the story is that they don't actually attack the wall in the book oh really yes there's a point where there's another large city that starts coming after london and then they destroy that large city with medusa right and then they move toward the wall but they never get there because they defeat it and the actual medusa like it's breaks down or something and destroys london essentially so right. at the end of the book there is no london and the wall is fine at the end of the movie london's still kind of there the people are there and the wall is jacked up so it'll be interesting if they do carry on well london isn't really there anymore they killed the, the well i mean gut. it could be rebuilt the mm. engine could be fixed. There's potential there that things could so move again. Was, where... was Valentine alive in the book by the end? No. No, okay. I feel like he might come back as a resurrected was... person. 
that was one of my only things that I want. I wanted, say, like uh, Rome to come along and London to have a fight with Rome. <laughs> you know, that was that was kind of what I was what I was hoping when they were building the weapon. I thought, oh, that's where they're going, rather than going towards the wall. I would love to see another European, like Berlin or Amsterdam, or so. I just, I'd love to see another European city in another film. That'd be really, really cool. To yeah, see if they is. if they are going to make uh, more films, then I just <sighs> Guys, don't think imagine... they're going to. Imagine Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> that would be rad. Rolling through the desert. That Traction city Vegas. is fine. <laughs> I can't see that city not surviving at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can't see them making another film, actually. You think? Yeah. I so think I... they finished... Oh, here we go. This is going to be three against one again. But they finish the film nicely. They go off into the future mm-hmm. together. The Londons, like, the Londoners are saved. They all live happily ever after. Or you can make up your own story, you know? Or read the yeah, other four true. books yeah. in the series. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but Brian's just said that the books don't finish yeah. the same as that, so it's different. Yeah. I I don't know. See, I'm, I, because I'm left I suppose it depends how it got on at the box office. True. I yeah, know. That's, exactly. real, that's really what matters. And it, it's to me, it's kind of like Star Wars, right? The end of A New Hope, that could have been the end and it would have been yeah. fine. Yeah. So it, it makes me wonder how the story progresses and I'm probably not going to wonder very long. So I think I'm going to go get the next book, and start reading it. Yeah. So, yeah. I thought but, it was, um, I thought it was interesting actually that we, um, they, t- they went the route of actually firing the big bad weapon. Cause normally, you know, you get the countdown yeah. and then everyone runs in and sit. And I was like, not only did it fire, it fired twice. <laughs> I was like, yeah, yeah. you don't very really get different. to see that. It was really devastating actually to, to watch the damage that that did to that wall i was like oh my gosh this this could be the thread for the next book so to speak if that wall's been so damaged because now it's Other vulnerable get through, yeah, yeah exactly vegas is coming <laughs> vegas is coming all kinds of shiny lights oh man I've got this the image pyramid caesar's palace it's like it would box. be kind of like uh, uh, for another mad max reference the the one with the guy with the guitar yeah <laughs> except that like times a thousand and the, that's the vegas traction scene. we need the bellagio just all dressed as elvis yeah, yeah. To yes, yes. <laughs> imagine like dallas coming too oh i just uh... it would just be a giant cowboy hat on wheels honestly texas is too texas to even settle on one city they would just call themselves texas <laughs> yeah. it would just be all the texas towns would eat each other and just become the traction city of texas yeah. yes so much scope here. there's so many cities i want to see <laughs> i know right like that that's what you were saying at the beginning just the world building and that's mm. part of why i enjoy it so much just the idea is terrific yes and it's very original it has an awesome steampunk feel which yeah. i love that kind of i don't know if you call it a genre just that kind of aesthetic i loved the costumes in this film actually i loved all of their all of their looks, um, especially actually the ones like London. I like um, the policeman. <laughs> yeah, he still looked like the, like the bobbies. bobbies. Yeah, yeah, and the mayor actually with his kind of like that cardinal vibe. But no, even like um, he was Balin Greyjoy uh, in yeah. Game of Thrones. Oh, is that who he was? Yeah. Okay, that makes a bit more sense. Um, but yeah, even like Catherine and Tom, like their whole look, like you say, it's that slight steampunk edge to them i i really enjoyed it oh it looked and then when cool. anna wang turns up and just complete okay. red and just is completely different than everyone else yes the scene. i thought she i was like well she's from somewhere she looked cleaner than everyone else i know that they were in that really grotty like market but yeah she turned up and i was like well you look healthy you're from somewhere better than this you know she seemed um and you could see like initially when they came to, you could see it under her like plane or whatever you want to call her it ship, yeah, her ship it? like landing in the background being completely different color than everything else I, it was very I, clever. I loved her ship actually i don't know what i loved it it almost looked like a dragonfly or something mm-hmm. really thought I, her ship was really really cool uh, that's that's all i've really got to say about her ship i don't know much about well, her it's not but it anymore, really is it? Cool. yeah it was cool i liked it and it's it not very cool. hers yes I like yeah. it. Yeah, Tom got it. The Air City. Oh my goodness. <gasps> yes. Oh yeah. Kind well, of looked like sad. a brain, didn't it? Like a floating brain. Mm. I don't know. Yeah. It was I just like a bunch of patches of hot air balloons stuck mm. together. Yeah. It did kind of look a bit like a brain, but that was very cool. I'm glad they 
kept that in. Yeah. What's that film watch the other day? Oh, Valoran. Valkyrie. Yeah, it was like, like the... But not Val- no, not Valkyrie. Um, Valerian. 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 Valerian, where they all like come together and they just added all that. And it seemed a little bit like that. Yeah. yeah. They just kept adding on to it. Yes. And more people were there. I quite like that hodgepodge look. Yeah. Um, you mm-hmm. know, even London had the same where stuff's been built around the old stuff. And yeah, I liked it. And it was the same with the wall. Like you could see how the everything had grown out from the wall. Well, the wall, um, right. the wall was there and things had been growing up yeah, the wall. Yeah. Yeah. It was really clever. Yeah. I just thought, yeah, the look was really cool, and then the sh- I'm, I'm glad the little ship survived to the end as well because I feel like it had some hairy moments. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was it was cool. It was just a very yeah, a visually very very nice looking film actually. Yeah. So the film lived up to the book, Brian. Yeah, I mean the book was better. I'm not gonna. Mm. If I had to go one versus the other, I I would I would prefer the story in the book, but the movie does it justice. I I think it does fall short with Catherine. Uh, Mm -hmm. I think like you said, they might've, they might've been able to just keep her out of it and it may have been better because her part was kind of awkward, Mm -hmm. but overall just the only things I was really missing was just more things you have in the book. And as I actually told Shelby afterward, I think they succeeded in giving you a better idea of what Shrike was going through at the end than they did in the book. Because mm-hmm. the way that it kind of flashes through his memories, oh, yeah. and then you finally see him get a memory of his true self. Yeah, that was rough. That was a lot more powerful visually than it was. Because it was like two sentences. And you know, you could you knew what he was going for, but he didn't spend as much time elaborating on it. Mm-hmm. And the just that one image where you see the photograph and then it be, kind of becomes alive and then you see that like that is who he was. And it's just that was probably like the most powerful part of the movie. Mm-hmm. Like Shrike is so awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That was um, ugh, that was rough. That was really, his whole story. <laughs> his whole story was was hard. I knew I kind of felt I liked him. where it was going. Yeah, where it was going. You know, mm-hmm. when you start having these these dolls, and then she finds the pitch, and I just I felt like I knew where we were kind of heading with him. And Hester and, looks oh, happy. Yeah, I wasn't in okay all with the flashbacks. It. She did. Yeah, mm-hmm. they seem exactly to have this kind of happiness. The two of them. Um, and then yeah, it was interesting. Obviously, that she then became so motivated by vengeance. Um, which is not usually the most, is not the best motivator. You know, if you want, if you go looking for blood, you're probably going to get it kind of thing. Was, okay, here's another question I'm going to put out to the group. Was it necessary for Hester to be Valentine's daughter? Oh, like the I am your father moment. Yeah. <laughs> you said it's more of a twist in the actual book, right, Brian? Right. Uh, in in the book, she has a mom and dad that get killed by Valentine. Oh, okay. And then we find out later that like that was not her actual dad and um her mom obviously got married and that's how she became pandora shaw Mm -hmm. and it's kind of i don't know it's a little silly because i mean the lady's name is pandora how many people named pandora are they but then Catherine figures out that uh valentine her dad used to have an assistant whose name was pandora Mm -hmm. that he was very close to and it turns out that's the same Pandora as Pandora Shaw. And it's like, come on, you couldn't put that together. Nah. But mm. at the same time, yeah. So it, it's a bigger twist because you think you know who her parents are. Mm. Until later you found out that yeah. you know her mom just got married to a guy after she had Hester. It just felt and Hester, like in the film it was a little bit cliche I almost Cliché. thought he was going to say, I am your father. I was like, are we going to get this? <laughs> I, like, I mean, it's even in the same, like, kind of... Yes! Kind of moment, yeah. She's down on the ground, or... No, she's not. I don't think she is. No, she's standing next to him. She's certainly... Kind of him. Like, yeah, she's not got the him. upper hand in the situation. She's definitely yeah. uh, against the ropes, isn't she? And, yeah, I was just like, oh, is this going to happen? That's not true. That's <laughs> yeah. yeah. I liked how she's like, whatever, fine, I'm just going to go with this and attack you. <laughs> The whole thing in the book was they were kind of playing it off against like Catherine was who Hester could have been. Yes. And they oh, like okay. they, that it's makes sense. real subtle throughout. They talk about how Catherine looks kind of like Hester if Hester hadn't got all mangled. And she's actually yeah. much worse in the book. Like she's missing an eye. She's oh, referred wow. to as like hideous 
and her nose is all like half jacked up. Uh-huh. So yeah, it's they they made her they beautified her for the movie. <laughs> well, they did. But, it's like Tyrion, isn't it? He he lost like his nose, <laughs> and, yeah. and stuff like that. And yeah, and um, they they definitely made they were a bit kinder on his uh on his scar <laughs> as well. Um, and who knows? Maybe next movie they'll just move it around. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> ne- the next movie it'll just be one little thing yeah. on her chin. We're gonna make this more pretty because it's a bit ugly now. <laughs> yeah. No, I like the thought of that. That was my first. As soon as they had that reveal, my first thought was like this: Hester, Catherine, like, well, what the, the scope then for storytelling of those two meeting and how yeah. how that would go down would be really interesting. But if she's dead in the book, then I'm not sure how that's gonna go. <laughs> you should read the book though because it's really cool what happens okay i will i'll do that no spoilers (laughs) i'll let you read it maybe we'll have a an off the shelf about it later yes yeah yeah that would be cool so as a roundup we did it before when we discussed grindelwald out of 10 so if you're up first why did you make me go first out of 10 what are you giving it um eight Shelby? Solid eight. Mm. Bryhan? I would give it a nine. I'd go back and see it right now. I really enjoyed it, so I'm all in. I really like this IP. Mm. Nines for me. Mm-hmm. I think when I left, I'd give it a seven and a half. But after talking about it, I'd give it an eight and a half. Oh. I there thought it was very visually pleasing. Uh-huh. Gave me nostalgia of London. <laughs> Who'd have thought? And there was enough little twists to keep me going and thinking, yeah, what's going to happen now? Yeah. I think it's like Brian said, it's a really, really great IP. It felt, it was just nice to sit there and watch something totally different. Um, there's so much, there's a lot of scope here for some really great stories to go on. Um, the characters were very compelling, you know, I I enjoyed all of them. Um, so yeah, no, I did. I really, really loved it. I'm so pleased we went to see it because actually... It probably isn't something, I'm going to get a little mushy on you here, had it not have been for this podcast, I might not have gone to see it. You know, it was Brian saying, I'm reading this book and it's great, and, you know, we want to talk about the movie that really chivied us to go and see it, didn't it? And it's, um, I'm really, really pleased we did. And it's more books Well, you're welcome. <laughs> so, uh, shall we, where can people contact the pod and find the pod? Uh, so if you're still listening on either Hyperspace Podblast or Bright Tree Radio Streams. Make sure you follow our new feed for Pods and Ends on iTunes. We're also on YouTube and anywhere else you listen to podcasts, whether that's Spotify, Google Play, Podbean, Cast and you can Box. find us... <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There's 50 million of them. Just, yeah, just type in Pods and Ends and subscribe. Find it. Yeah, just figure it out. We would really appreciate a review to let us know what you think of the new podcast. Uh, Drop some stars. It helps other people find it. You can interact with us. We love interacting with people. Thank you so much to Roku Depot for your comments on our last episode uh, talking about Grindelwald. And um, you can follow us on Twitter at P-N-E underscore pod and find us on Instagram with the same handle. You can email us at contact at podsandends.com. And you can also check out our website, tripledubs.podsandends.com, for not much content now, but more to come. Yeah. Woo. So we will catch you guys later. Let us know what you think about Mortal Engines and everything else we talked about today. Thanks for listening. Ciao for Don't now. Don't listen to the new Pitbull song. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Ocean to ocean. Bye.